video, I want to introduce you to periodic functions. A function is said to be periodic if it has a regular repeating pattern over time. For example, the functions I've given you below are periodic in nature, though not perfectly repeating. In the real world, we very rarely see a perfectly repeating graph. We often refer to these types of patterns as cyclical or per periodic. The first graph shows us the temperature of the water in degrees Celsius for the San Rafael River near Green River, Utah. And the graph is shown for one week and every day there's a low and a high on the graph. So it cycles from a low to a high, a low to a high, a low to a high, making a nice smooth curve as the temperature changes. It isn't perfect. It doesn't go to the same high and the same low every day, but it is periodic in that it cycles up and down in roughly the same pattern. The second graph is the US voter turnout by age group. So there's actually four graphs in this picture and it's looking at the cycle of elections. So we tend to have a major election where we elect a president and then a midterm election halfway between and the graph goes up. And for every age group, the graph goes up when we get to a major election and down when we get to a midterm and then up for a major election, down for a midterm. And that happens every two years. Now, the pattern isn't exactly the same. Each age group has different highs and different lows. And this one isn't a smooth curve. It simply goes up and down, up and down in a jagged edged graph. But for every age range, it goes up and down in the same pattern. So up in the major election, down in the midterm election. Now, as I said, rarely is a periodic function in the real world exactly regular. And so it's also good to know that periodic functions can actually decrease or increase in magnitude of their y values over time. So while they are cycling up and down, they can actually also increase or decrease. For example, in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, the atmospheric carbon dioxide has been measured for decades. And over any given year, the carbon dioxide goes up and then down and then back up. So we have a nice periodic graph from year to year, but the overall trend between the 60s and today is that the graph has risen from values below 320 ppmv for carbon dioxide to values near 400 ppmv now. Now to get a function like this, we actually just couple a periodic function with some other growth or decay function like a linear function or an exponential function. So we add a linear function to a periodic function to get a graph that looks like the graph of the atmospheric carbon dioxide. This curve, by the way, was started in 1958 by David Keening when he began carefully measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And this has produced one of the most accurate longitudinal measurements of CO2 rise that we have. It's a famous curve. It has starred in both books and movies. Now, the idea of a periodic function relates to the idea of moving around and around in a circle. So imagine that we track your angle in radians and your xy position as you travel around a circle of radius 1. So we're going to write down every position, um, every 45 degrees, as a triple of the radian angle, the x coordinate, and the y coordinate. Now this is fairly easy to do on the axes. So when we're on the x axis, on a circle of radius 1, so then we're actually at the point 0 radians, 1 for the x value, 0 for the y value. When I get up to the 90 degree angle or the pi over 2 angle, then the triple would be pi over 2, the x value would be 0, and the y value will be 1. When I get to 180 degrees or pi as the radians angle, I would be at pi, then negative 1 for the x value, and 0 for the y value. And finally, moving to 270 degrees or 3 pi over 2 in radians, I would be at 3 pi over 2 which is measured out by 0 as an x value and negative 1 as a y value. I do want us to figure out what happens for the x and y value at these 45 degree angles. And one nice way to think about that is to imagine these 45 degree angles uh, producing a triangle where the hypotenuse has a length of 1 because it goes out to a circle of radius 1. 
and then if we draw a perpendicular from the top of that triangle down to the axis, then what we've produced is a isosceles right triangle with a radius of 1. And we can actually figure out what those other two sides are because we can apply the Pythagorean theorem to a right triangle. So right now let's just say that these two sides have a measurement of a. And the Pythagorean theorem says that on a right triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now for us, a and b are the same. So we can say a squared plus a squared equals, and then the c value is always the hypotenuse, and so that's going to be 1 squared. So a squared plus a squared equals 1 squared. That means we have 2a squared equals 1, because 1 squared is 1. We'll divide both sides by 2. So 2a squared over 2 equals 1 over 2. We simplify 2 over 2 to make 1. And now we have a squared equals 1 half. We can solve that using a square root on both sides. So the square root of a squared and the square root of 1 half. Now normally when we do the square root of a square, we would consider that it could have been positive or negative, but in this case we're talking about distances on a triangle. So we're going to assume they're positive. So a is the square root of 1 half, and we could write that as the square root of 1 over the square root of 2, or 1 over the square root of 2. Now sometimes when we have square root of 2 in the denominator, we write what's called a rationalized form of that. And that means we get the square root out of the denominator. If we rationalize 1 over the square root of 2, we would be multiplying it by the square root of 2 over the square root of 2. And that would give us the square root of 2 over 2. So we often see 1 over the square root of 2 or square root of 2 over 2, either of those as the sides of this isosceles right triangle. So now we do know the measurements for a. We know that both sides are equal to 1 over the square root of 2. And so we can now write the triples for these. At the angle of pi over 4 radians, we would move to the left 1 over square root of 2 units and up 1 over square root of 2 units. The next 45 degree reference angle that we have is actually at an actual angle of 135 degrees to get from the x-axis to there. And we call that in radians 3 pi over 4. So the next triple we could write would be 3 pi over 4. And then moving to that angle, we would actually have to go negative 1 over square root of 2 and then positive 1 over square root of 2. The next 45 degree reference would be at 5 pi over 4. 225 degrees. And to get to that point, we would have had to go on negative 1 over the square root of 2, and then negative 1 over the square root of 2 down. 5 pi over 4, negative 1 over square root of 2, negative 1 over square root of 2 for our triple. And then finally for the triple for 7 pi over 4, to get to that point, we would go positive 1 over square root of 2, and then down negative 1 over square root of 2. Now that we have triples for all of those values, we're going to plot theta, the angle, on the horizontal axis, and y from the triple on the y-axis. So from each pair here, I'm going to plot the first value of the triple and the last value of the triple. So the first point I'm plotting is 0 for theta and 0 for the y value. The second triple would be pi over 4 for theta and 1 over the square root of 2 for the y value. Now 1 over the square root of 2, we should probably figure out what that is as a decimal. So let's pop over to Desmos and find what 1 divided by the square root of 2 actually is, and it's approximately 0 0.707. So let's plot pi over 4 with point 707. The next point we want to plot is pi over 2 with the y value of 1. Then 3 pi over 4 with the y value of 1 over the square root of 2, or 0 0.707. Then pi with the y value of 0. 
then 5 pi over 4 with a y value of negative 1 over square root of 2, or negative 0 0.707. Then 3 pi over 2 with negative 1. Then 7 pi over 4 with negative 1 over the square root of 2, so 7 pi over 4 with negative 0 0.707. And then finally back up to the axis with uh, 2 pi comma 0. And when we take a step back and look at these points, the y values go 0, 0 0.7071, 1, 0 0.7070, 0, negative 0 0.707, negative 1, negative 0 0.7070. 0. We have a cyclic function, and you can actually, if we were to graph more points, draw a smooth curve through this function. If we went around the circle again, we would get the exact same function again, and this is what makes it periodic. We would pass through all of the same points again, just at larger theta values. Now the next thing we're going to do is plot those theta values, but with the x-coordinate instead of the y-coordinate. I'm going to use a different color of highlighter to highlight those values as we go as I read them out loud. So we would start with 0 for theta and 1 for the y-value. Next, I would plot pi over 4 with 1 over the square root of 2, so pi over 4 with 0 0.707. Then I'll plot pi over 2 with 0. Then 3 pi over 4 with negative 1 over the square root of 2. 3 pi over 4 with negative 0 0.707. Pi with negative 1. 5 pi over 4 with negative 1 over square root of 2, so 5 pi over 4 with negative 0 0.707. 3 pi over 2 with 0, 7 pi over 4 with 1 over the square root of 2, so 7 pi over 4 with 0 0.707, positive 0 0.707. And then getting back to 2 pi, I would be back at a value of 2 pi comma 1. And so this curve, if I read through the y values here, moving across in equally spaced points, I have 1, 0 0.707, 0.0. Negative 0 0.707, negative 1, negative 0 0.707, 0, positive 0 0.707, 1. So this is that same periodic function, but we're starting at the top of it now instead of starting at the middle. So we're starting at the top and moving down to the bottom and then coming back up to the top at 2 pi. Now the first graph that we built is called a sine graph, and we actually define sine as the y value of that triple. And so the y value of that graph is actually sine theta. Let's label this top graph with y equals sine theta. And this bottom graph, now this second graph we drew, is called a cosine function. And here we actually define the x value of that triple as cosine theta. So this graph we're going to call y equals cosine theta. And that means that that triple would actually be theta comma cosine theta comma sine theta. We simplify that by saying that every point on the circle of radius 1 can be defined as cosine theta, sine theta as the x value and y value of that point on the circle. 